Welcome back to the What's Your One More podcast. I am joined with a very special guest who's returning to the show for the first time. I'm so excited to have you back on the show, Mr. Dan Habib. Thanks for joining us today, brother. It's great to have you back. Quinn, thanks so much for having me, man. It is an honor to be with you, and I'm so excited and happy to hear about your guys' success with over a million views. And boy, I've been watching the show, having some amazing guests on there. Really loved your last guest there, Vijay Singh. So congratulations to you and, and very excited to be here. Oh man, thank you. I tell you what, you were one of the first ones to jump on the show, actually episode nine. Uh, super grateful that uh, you, you spent some time with us here. But you know, you're no stranger to our audience, but for some new listeners that, that don't quite know a lot about Dan, let me fill you in briefly here. Dan's been involved in the mortgage industry for well over 18 years. Uh, he was just honored by the National Mortgage Professional Magazine by being named one of the top 40 under 40 mortgage professionals in the country. And he was also presented the Housing Wire's Rising Star Award, which acknowledges young leaders in the industry. And currently, he's the chief revenue officer for the highway, which is encumbering MBS Highway, CMA, and now List Reports. Congratulations on that buyout that you guys just completed, brother. Thank you, man. We're excited. Yeah. So this is, uh, we're, we're going to get right to that here. Um, and, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the economy because our audience just, you know, like I said, they love the way you eloquently broke down the crypto market. I had so many people come up to me and go, ah, like he actually helps me understand it to where I'm not fearful of it. And then your take on, you know, Fed, economy, mortgage rates, so forth and so on was spot on. I can't wait to hear what you have to say about the second half. But let's jump right into the highway here. You know, for our audience, you know, if you don't know who MBS Highway is right now, you're either not in the mortgage industry, you're not in real estate, potentially, you know, uh, just have no no type of interest in real estate. Because if you're in it and you don't know, you're living under a rock. But the, you know, MBS Highway has, has launched a couple years ago, CMA for Certified Mortgage Advisor and then recently merged with list or bought list reports and merged it all together to make the highway. And we were just talking about this. And I mean, what an exciting product, what an exciting lineup. Dan, can you take a minute just to explain to our audience all the amazing stuff you guys have going on? Yeah. So for those of you that aren't familiar with MBS Highway, it's a platform designed to really help educate mortgage professionals, make them the expert on the market, be able to articulate the opportunities and provide them with data for every market so you can see things like the forecasted appreciation in the places you're doing business and really tools to help you to overcome any points of friction or challenges. And again, show customers you know, what the better decision is, whether it's buying versus renting, whether it's taking money out of their home and doing a cash out refi, even going to a higher rate, bidding over asking price, the cost of waiting, you name it, we've developed a tool to really help you be that expert and to close more transactions and increase your conversion. And, you know, we were really excited about seeing what List Reports was doing. You know, they have some really great technology, a great platform. They have exposure to hundreds of thousands of real estate agents out there. And one of the products they have is called Elite, where as a mortgage professional, obviously you want to gain more relationships. You want to protect the ones you have and you want to provide value, but you want to do so in a way that's automated without putting another brick in your backpack. So Elite automatically for the agents that you are paired with will send them every piece of marketing they need for their open houses and such and their new listings that they have. And it's all co-branded with you and you're delivering the value to them on a consistent basis, gives them daily shareables on social, daily insights, and they also have something called agent intel, which is all the intelligence you would need on both agents and loan officers if you're on the recruiting side. But being able to see in different areas, hey, here's the agents I'm working with. Here's how much wallet share I actually have. Are they cheating on me or not? Are they sending me all their business? But also, here's the agents I should be working with and all kinds of intel on them. So you know, how much business are they doing on the buy and sell side? Who are they giving their transactions to? Are they going to someone with the same last name? Well, it can be hard not to crack there. And then here's all their active listings that they have. You know, so it really gives you all of the insights you need to be able to prospect the agents that you actually want to work with and spend the time with. And we've then gone and really created a product that bridges the gap between MBS Highway and List Reports, where either online or right through your phone, you could write an agent's name to a number and get a full breakdown on them and see what their active listings are. And then from there, you want to send something to that agent to show the value that you can provide and why they need to work with you. You know, it's not like you want to just give them your business card or take them the coffee, right? I mean, there's an old book there, The Art of War, that I really like the saying in is, is that Every battle is either won or lost before it's fought. You know, what are you doing to win the battle with those agents before it's fought? Well, we try to make it quick and easy for you where now you can click on that listing for that prospective agent 
send them pieces from MBS Highway, the buy versus rent, the investment property analysis, the automated valuation model, the real estate report card, you name it. And also you can send the pieces from list reports, the open house flyers and the marketing kits with a script that's done for you. So within seconds, you can effectively reach out to these agents with something that's going to hit their particular activator because it's for their listing and show the value you can provide and give you a much better chance of cultivating that relationship. I mean, dude, I'm like over here drooling because this product is incredible. You know, as an originator, when I originated, I couldn't imagine being able to do that for my phone and the ability to ease of use and technology. And, you know, some of the companies that that you guys are eliminating by, you call it a brick in your backpack or a snap-on tool, whatever you say, you don't have to use any of that anymore. It's all right there inside of this one one housing system at the highway. And I mean, I I can't wait to get this in the hands of our team and start using it in combination with everything else. And, and I will say this, if you haven't taken advantage of the CMA platform, this is something that we oftentimes get questions. People are like, how do you guys like, how do you keep up with this stuff? How do you know this stuff? What a great way to immerse yourself in the markets and under, actually understanding the markets and not relaying so much on the news, you know, or relying, excuse me, so much on the news to tell you what's going on. Like you can actually understand and do it yourself. And I think CMA well, is a wonderful platform. Yeah. The way I like to explain it is, is, you know, every day in MBS Highway, we break down what's happening in the market with a video. We monitor what's happening with rates and tell you when you should be flooding or locking your transactions. But you know, you only have so much time on those daily videos. Right. If you want a really deep fundamental understanding of the things that we talk about every single day, really deep dive on technical analysis, the Fed, how the economic reports work, how rate locks actually work, things like APR and how to and how to you know play against that. You name it. It's really the education that everybody should be getting in the mortgage industry right. in a consumable course that gives you a big differentiator because. Listen, you can use it as a big competitive advantage because even though there's a lot of good LOs out there, many of them get it, relationships, closing deals and such, the vast majority don't understand what's happening in the market, what's driving it, and can't articulate the opportunity to their customers. So if you're able to do so, you know, in this market, I don't think it's a novelty anymore. I think it's a must. I couldn't agree more. And, and to your point, you know, to become a loan officer, you take a state test or your federally licensed test, and those tests are all a joke. Half of them are half outdated. So you're, t you're learning to the test, not to the environment. And so, you know, having a tool like CMA, you know, by your side to help you with that, with referable material, you can always go back to, I can't tell you how many times I've pulled out the charts that you have put together over there, you know, showing certain things that are happening and patterns and technical analysis. I go back to it all the time. It's just a one, I can't stop raving about it. I, I feel like I should be getting like a, a part-time job over there at MBS Highway. I'm a huge <laughs> fan. You guys know that huge well, fan of the you. whole team over there. So speaking of policy, speaking of the Fed, speaking of what's going on, you know, last time we were on the show, we talked about a lot of stuff, but here we are mid-year. And mid-year, we just had our first pause of the Federal Reserve since the previous nine hikes. You know, is this a pause heard around the world or is this just a temporary backup and let's see what's happening until the PCE comes out tomorrow? Yeah, so the Fed, they actually hiked like 10 meetings in a row. <laughs> and they took the Fed funds rate from a range of zero to a quarter percent to now up five percentage points to a range between five and five, or five and a quarter percent. Now, this is one of the most aggressive, fastest paces of rate hikes that we have ever seen. And the Fed, even though they paused, they even said, we don't really want to cause it a, call it a pause, more like a skip. <laughs> they decided at this last meeting that they were going to hold rates where they were. But if you take a look at their dots plots, which gives you projections on what each Fed member thinks is going to happen, even just Powell talking yesterday with other central bankers. And you know, previously, he did his semi-annual testimony to the House and the Senate. You know, made it pretty clear that most Fed members think that the Fed's going to be hiking again this year, probably two more times because they still feel that inflation is too hot, not coming down fast enough, and because they think the jobs market is too strong. Now, we can certainly you know explore some of those things, but they wanted to you know, give themselves a little bit of time before deciding at their July 26th meeting what to do. But the odds are, if you look at the market expectations, you look at the Fed futures, is 70 something percent that they are going to be hiking 25 basis points. Now, okay. you know, in my opinion, I think the Fed's already done more than enough. If you take a look at some of the problems they're causing with this, I mean, they certainly did not help and, and were partly to blame for the banking crisis that mm -hmm. we saw, where you know the Fed hiking rates so aggressively, you know, short-term treasuries, money market accounts, those are directly tied to the Fed funds rate. So you have these things going up so quickly as a consumer, and I have my, if I have my money at a bank deposited there, you know, that's getting me like a fraction of a percent. 
And now you're giving those consumers a better option where why wouldn't I want to take that money and invest it in a short-term treasury or money market account where now I can get close to 5%, maybe even above that in some cases. You'd almost be foolish not to. Hey, listen, personally, I did that with a lot of money, right? I did so, too, yep. So what happens then? Well, banks, you know, they got put in a tough position because your deposit to them is a liability. And we're in a fractional reserve banking system. What that means is, is they don't have to keep all your money on hand at any time. And usually that works because not everybody's taking their money out at the same time. So it's roughly 10% they keep on hand. But now if you have all these deposits rapidly fleeing, the bank's put in a tough position. They have to raise capital. Well, you know, oftentimes you could do that, you know, based on your your share price and things like that. But a lot of these bank stocks got killed, you know, sharks in the water, shorting them and such. So they had to sell assets. But the problem with them selling assets is this, is that, you know, they bought all these you know, safe assets, right? So when you when you deposit your money to bank, they can lend it out at a higher rate and make that arbitrage, or they can invest it in safe bonds. Well, they couldn't invest it in any short-term safe bonds because before this rate hike cycle, Fed kept rates at zero for so long, and there was no yield on the short end of the curve. So these banks were forced to invest in things like 10-year treasuries or safe mortgage-backed securities. Well, they bought them when rates were somewhere between, I don't know, one and 2% on those things, right? Or they were much lower And now you're taking a look at rates have gone so much higher, even on the long end. So now if they want to come up with cash or money for these depositors, they're selling these things at a loss. And many of these banks assume billions of dollars of losses. But it also has an impact with what's happening with mortgage rates. Because, you know, one of the things we also want to talk a little bit about here is inflation. And although inflation is still too hot, it's been coming down significantly and normally that would lead to some declines in mortgage rates because inflation is one of the main driver of mortgage rates. However, we haven't really seen rates benefiting come down, even though in a normal market they would. Part of the reason for that is there's been a lot of selling in the bond market, specifically from these banks coming up with deposit of money. So just like if it was a stock, you have all this selling pressure on a stock, You know, even if you're getting good news on that you can still see the stock price come down, right? It's similar in this nature where if you have all this bank selling because deposits are fleeing to come up with this money, it's going to push bond prices lower. And because of the inverse correlation, that pushes rates higher. Yeah, and you're, you're flooding the market with bonds at that point and, and mortgage-backed mm-hmm. securities specifically. And a lot of people don't understand that, you know? And I appreciate you enlightening the audience with that. And I've seen some, um, how can I say it? I, I've seen some things on social media where you're like, um, hey guys, Really, this is what we're talking about. Like people are jumping up and down. Where's our five percent rate? You know, I thought you said five was coming, and it's like, well, there's something else happening in the background here, and it's exactly what you just said. So I appreciate you clarifying that. Well, for the audience. you know, there was yeah, obviously we had initially thought that we would see rates come down a bit sooner, mm-hmm. right? And I still think that we are going to see rates move lower as we get a little bit later this year. But the initial thought was that, hey, around May 10th when we get the uh, April inflation data, we should start to see one of the biggest components of inflation, shelter costs, start to catch up. And what I mean by that is this. When you look at the inflation reports, a lot of the items are coming down. And inflation, if you look at the consumer price index, the headline number, it it was at 9.1% at the peak. It's now down to 4%. So that's a big drop, but it actually should be lower. The biggest single component of CPI inflation is shelter costs. That is rental costs or something called owner's equivalent rent, which in my opinion is not a great metric, but it's supposed to capture the value, the rise or fall in, in home prices. Yeah, it's right? pretty outdated. What it, well, what they actually do is they ask people that own homes how much they would rent their home for. So they look at housing as like a service as opposed to looking at actual appreciation numbers. So this is a big lag and it makes up 43% of the CPI. So you've seen the CPI essentially get cut, you know, in more than in half or so, but that's all along while shelter costs are still up significantly. They're, they're showing that they're up like 8.8% or so on a year over year basis within the CPI index. But if you look real time, you know, on a year over year basis, rental costs are essentially flat. And on a year over year basis, appreciation costs are pretty, uh, or I should say home prices are pretty flat compared to, you know, the numbers of June of last year where you saw the peak in home prices, right? So you shouldn't be seeing, you know, all this inflation from a shelter component, but 
it looks at the data over the last year and averages it, and there's a big lag there. We're finally starting to see the shelter costs and the CPI roll over. But the thought was is that, hey, we're going to see inflation start to really come down, shelter's going to roll over, and we should start to see this benefit in mortgage-backed securities and interest rates. We've been seeing the moves that we've expected in inflation, but rates haven't improved. And part of the reason for that is what we just explained right. with a lot of the selling from banks in long-duration bonds. The other one was the debt ceiling. You know, the debt ceiling didn't help matters either. You had all kinds of uncertainty, what's going to happen with the U.S. credit rating, with the Treasury, are they going to be able to make Treasury payments? They finally came to an agreement. But part of that agreement was that you're going to have over a trillion more in debt that's got to be issued as a result of raising this debt ceiling. And that is the way that happens is that the Treasury then has to issue treasuries, right? So the good news is, is that it's mostly on the short end, right? So they're not going to be issuing 10-year treasuries or things like that. They're going to be issuing, you know, two-year or less maturity, either treasuries or bills to come up with this money. And so far, so good as far as that additional supply mm -hmm. being absorbed by the market. But now that that's behind us, that was causing some problems. And the bank selling, you know, if you look at the latest data for deposits at banks, it was really coming down. Just last week, deposits actually increased uh, quite a bit. So we're hoping that we're seeing some stabilization there. And also the debt ceiling is now behind us. And it looks like that's so far so good on the additional supply being absorbed. So now maybe we can return to fundamentals. And fundamentals would be mortgage rates and the bond market on the long end starting to follow the path of inflation. Now, the next big report we're going to be getting is, you know, I don't know when this is going to be released, but we get it tomorrow we... Yep. Tomorrow, we have the PCE, Personal Consumption Expenditures Inflation Report. So just to break this down, there's really two main inflation reports that the markets look at. You have the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. I think that's a better read. And then you have the PCE, Personal Consumption Expenditures. That's the Fed's favorite measure of inflation. So when we just speak to that one, there's two components of these inflation reports. There is something called the headline all-in inflation number. And then there's something called the core rate of inflation. The core rate strips out food and energy prices. Now, you might say to yourself, well, why would they want to look at the core rate? Food and energy, I spent a lot of money on that. And the answer is, is because that's what the Fed feels that they can influence with their monetary policy. So if you have some geopolitical turmoils, if you have OPEC cutting production, right, the Fed could hike or cut rates all they want. That's not going to influence the price of oil because you have these other factors. If you have, you know, some kind of weather issues that impacts a crop and, and the supply of that, you, you can't impact food prices to a high degree with what the Fed's doing. So the Fed, what they want to do is really measure what their monetary policy is doing. So they remove food and energy prices, and then they get what's called the core rate of inflation. Well, the PCE, the current numbers for the headline is 4.4%, and for the core is 4.7%. Now, the Fed's target is they want to see that core rate drop down to 2%. So while it's made progress, it's still you know nowhere near where the Fed wants. Now, when we talk about what we're expecting tomorrow, well, we're expecting a very low reading on the headline of one-tenth of a percent. So mm -hmm. what is that going to do to that year-over-year -year reading of 4.4%? Well, the way this thing works is because it's a year-over-year -year reading, the number for May from 2022 is going to fall off of the year-over-year -year calculation and be replaced with the number for May of 2023. Well, the number we're replacing is six-tenths. If the estimates are right and we get one-tenth, you should see a five-tenth or half a percent decline in the headline year-over-year -year PCE. So that would take it from 4.4 to 3.9 percent. Hey, that's a really nice move lower and finally potentially getting a three-handle on inflation. But the core rate, which the Fed focuses more on, is currently at 4.7%. You're not seeing it come down as much because oil prices and energy prices have really come down. That's been helping things. It removes that. You know, Food prices have cooled off quite a bit. So the core rate's a little bit stickier. And you know, when you take a look at the shelter costs, those are holding it up. It makes up a huge percentage of that. We're not expecting to see as low of a monthly reading. We're expecting to see a monthly reading of, let's say, three-tenths. Well, that's going to be replacing a reading of just over three tenths from last year. So I think the core rate, you could see either stay at four seven or potentially get down to four six. So depends what the market looks at. You know, the market might be happy that the headline number drops significantly, but 
may not be too happy that the core rate is not going to make much progress in this report. Now, when we fast forward to July 12th, that's when we're going to get the next CPI inflation report. And the market pays a lot of attention to that because that one we get first. That's going to be the first reading for June of inflation data that we get. I think the headline is going to drop from 4% down all the way to 3%. Wow. So that's going to be a big drop. I think that will be a favorable day in the markets. But ultimately, you know, we're seeing some pesky things that are, are, are hurting interest rates right now. But I do think that as we get further in the year, we will, in fact, see some improvement in rates. I mean, even if we got down to, you know, the low sixes, I think that would make a big difference. But mm -hmm. if we get a little lucky, I think you can see a five handle on it. One of the other things out there that is, I think, confusing a lot of people is the jobs data. You know, the jobs data is something else that the Fed's watching very closely. You know, the Fed says, oh, we can't stop hiking rates because inflation is too high. And because the jobs market is still way too tight and way too strong. But, you know, Quentin, the jobs data, it can be very confusing, but it's very interesting to dive into. You know, if you just look at the last jobs report we got, we saw 339,000 job creations. Now, that looks like a blockbuster jobs report. However, what most people don't realize is that within this jobs report, there's actually two surveys there. There's something called the business survey. And that's where you get that headline job creation number, the 339,000. Problem with that report is this. They use a ton of modeling. They use something called the birth-death ratio of businesses. That's where they are trying to look at, hey, about how many businesses came online versus went offline. And based on the sector they're in, about how many jobs does that account for either gained or lost? Does a terrible job of capturing inflection points in the market. If you look through history, it always misses the turning points because of all this modeling that they use. And it's also why you see these huge hundred plus thousand revisions month to month. I consider it very inaccurate in times like this. But then remember, you also have something called the household survey within the same jobs report. Now that is where you get the unemployment rate from. And it also has its own job creation component. Now, unlike that business survey, which showed 339,000 job creations, in the same report, this showed 310,000 job losses. Now, this is the one that I think does a much better job of capturing these turning points in the labor market and in the economy. And it's the reason why the unemployment rate quietly went up significantly. It went from 3.4 to 3.7%. The other thing that I think showed weakness in this report is hours worked. So this is like, what is the output of the mm -hmm. labor market, right? And when you take a look at it, what can businesses do to save costs besides laying them off. Well, they could cut the hours that you work. And if you look at the hours worked, it dropped again. And if you were to say, hey, how many jobs does that equate to? Because remember, the labor market's like, you know, 160 something million people that are working. If on average, their hours worked was cut by one tenth of an hour, it doesn't sound like that much. You know, if you extrapolated that to how many jobs that would account for, it'd be like 428,000. So if you you know, call it kind of apples to apples here with how many hours they're working, you, know, you would have seen job losses on that headline number if it wasn't for the hours being cut. Yeah. And I mean, wow, a lot to unpack there. A lot to unpack. <laughs> and I got a lot of questions. I've taken notes on here for our audience and myself. So first I want to start with this, you know, core PCE, that's the model that the Federal Reserve has openly said, and they've bounced around a couple of different ones, you know, from super core inflation to sticky. But mm -hmm. the PCE is the most recent podium measurement that Powell has used and said, you know, we want to see that get to two. So mm -hmm. I asked myself this question, if you're wanting to see it get to two, like that's your target rate, why pause? Why pause? You're not there. As you just mentioned, probably not going to achieve that. Why pause? I don't think that they're going to achieve it in general. Just think <laughs> about this, right? So in order to get a reading of 2% on the core PCE year over year, that would mean that every month for a year on average, you would have to get 0.167, okay? Okay. You know, if you look to history, I mean, that is very, very hard to achieve. I don't think the Fed's going to get down to their 2% target unless you get like a, a, a really good recession, you yep. get some kind of crisis that happens. You know, I think this 2% target, you know, if you actually look to history, you know, this was discussed in a meeting where some people are like, where the heck did they come up with 2%? This was like a random number that was thrown out by Janet Yellen many years ago. Alan Greenspan said, don't let this number get out because forget it. It'll be a problem. Everybody be focused on this 2%. 2 sure enough, it did get out. And exactly what Greenspan said happened. But, you know, 
I don't think there's like a magical 2% number. I think the Fed will be happy if we saw inflation come down, you know, to within the threes or so. But to be honest with you, based on everything I see happening in the in the market, I think the new norm is not going to be sub 2% inflation or 2% inflation. I think the new norm is going to be, you know, three something percent inflation for the next, you know, several years to come. I don't think that we're going to see this, you know, magically come down barring some kind of, you know, recession or something like that. And, you know, that's something else that we could talk about right. because there's a lot of people out there that say, oh, well, we can't get a recession because the job market's too strong because the unemployment rate's too low. Well, you know, couple of things I want to unpack here on this, right? Where if you take a look, there's a lot of mixed signals in the economy right now, right? So you have the stock market that's doing really well. You have and and you know it's been led by like, you know, eight stocks or so. So it's not a, a good breadth of the stock market there. Um, but obviously a lot of those companies helped out by AI and things mm -hmm. like that. But when you take a look at Manufacturing in the U.S., man, all of the manufacturing in indexes have been in contraction for quite some time now. You look at something like leading economic indicators, which is a diffusion index that looks at, it's more forward-looking at all of these different sections of the economy. That's been negative for 14 months in a row. The last time we saw a clip of like 14 negatives in a row, it was in 2007, right before the Great Recession. So these things can turn pretty quickly, and I'm seeing a lot of signs of it. But then the jobs market specifically, the jobs reports lagging old data. And we talked about why the headline number isn't good at capturing inflection points. Yes, the unemployment rate is still relatively low at 3.7, but it just moved up from 3.4. And if you look at every market cycle in history, when do you get a recession? Well, it is not. And pull up a chart on this, right? It's the unemployment rate and recessions. It's not when the unemployment rate's high. It's when the unemployment rate reaches its lowest point and then begins to turn higher that's precisely when you get the recession. I would argue that the low is in at three, four. We just saw it turn higher. The next jobs data we get over the next two weeks is going to be very important. I'm looking forward to seeing what that comes out. But I think you're going to start to see maybe the headline number catch up a bit. I think you're going to see the unemployment rate continue to move higher. And, you know, the Fed, their hikes has a slowdown impact on the economy, which isn't fully felt, right? I mean, they've hiked five percentage points. You know, think about it. Car loans, much more expensive. Credit card debt that people have, which is now at record highs. Mm -hmm. Servicing that debt's more expensive because the Fed's been hiking. Businesses aren't able to borrow money as easily. It's much more expensive and expand their businesses. And the banking crisis has caused some effects that we're just starting to see. I mean, the amount of loans and credit that you're seeing in the economy is down sharply. And this is something that a lot of people out there that are experts say this is almost like the Fed hiking another 100 basis points, this credit crunch that we're seeing. So, you know, I personally think that we're going to continue to see the economy slow and that we will eventually see a recession probably somewhere around the, the third or fourth quarter of this year, if I had to take a guess. And if that happens, you know, maybe that's when the Fed says, OK, we, we definitely don't need to, to, to hike here. We definitely are going to see inflation come down more because when the economy goes into a recession, you see things contract, slow down spending comes down and you see inflation come down in mortgage rates as well. So, you know, my my base case is that we are going to see you know the Fed probably hike again. I think that even though I don't think they should, I think they've done enough if they were patient inflation would come down. That you're going to see the job market start to show some more cracks. I think you're going to see more signs of the economy slowing. I think we will eventually get a recession and I think you're going to see mortgage rates improve. I wish they would have already for those that are listening in the space. And in a normal market, they would have with inflation making progress. But I think that now that some of these things are behind us, like the debt ceiling and banking crisis, at least for now, I think that you're going to start to see the bond market follow fundamentals a bit more. And I'm expecting to see some lower rates. You know, if you take a look at how meaningful it would be, the mortgage application data we just got, you know, it shows you that refinances, you know, if we look at rates like last year, you know, Rates now on a year over year basis, they were only about three quarters of a percent higher than they are uh, today than they were back then. But refinance activity was like 66% higher, right? Mm. So, you know, that would put rates. I mean, if you got rates to 6%, I think you'd see a lot more activity in the market. Yeah, no, I can tell you firsthand, I agree with that. Now, do you think, you think the Federal Reserve potentially raising rates is like fishing with dynamite, you know, in that analogy, you know, when you throw dynamite in the ocean, the grouper comes up. Yeah, you don't want to see grouper die, but it's grouper a whale starts to come up, we got a problem. And, you know, and everybody starts going, hey, hey, a whale's coming to the surface. In this particular case, is the well the regional banking system? I would certainly agree with that statement. You know, I think that um, the bank, uh, the Fed, 
typically what they do is they hike rates until they break something. <laughs> you know, the Federal Reserve. What uh, you know, what aggravates me about the Fed is is that you know, I'm, I'm you're a sports fan, I you know, because mm-hmm. we were talking about this before, right? Why was Wayne Gretzky such a great hockey player? Well, he doesn't go, he didn't skate to where the puck is. He skated to where the puck's going to be. You know, the Fed, I would argue, with their monetary policy. They're not skating to where the puck's going to be. They're not skating to where the puck is even. They're skating to where the puck was because they are all looking at old data that is lagging behind to make their decisions, right? So it's like driving while looking in the rear view mirror. You know, if you look at any real-time indicators out there, you're seeing signs of this. I mean, I get a, 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 I'm blessed to talk to, you know, some smart people in the economy that are much smarter than I, you know, Peter Bugvar, John Malden, Lacey Hunt, you know, a um, guy that ran the most successful bond portfolio of all time. Um, you know, you name it, David Rosenberg, all, all of them are kind of seeing it similarly where, yeah. you know, the Fed's like already done enough here. If they were looking at the real time indicators of where the puck's going to be, where the puck's going to be, then, you know, they would stop here and give the economy a chance to, to do what they want to do. Because remember, the impact of a rate hike that could take like, you know, a year to really fully show up. And there's a cumulative impact of all these rate hikes. And they've already caused the second, third, and fourth largest bank in history to go under. So by continuing to hike, you're only exacerbating that situation. And I think putting more banks at risk. And I think that the ones that are at risk are those regional banks, you know, and and, and who's benefiting? The JP Morgans <laughs> the of the dogs. world are benefiting, yeah. <laughs> right? Because even though there's rules out there that they're not allowed to, you know, uh, you know, necessarily acquire some of these banks and get bigger. You know, they also there was also a rule that they have to take the lowest offer in purchasing these banks. And JP Morgan, they made an exception and allowed them to do so. So you're making some of these ones bigger and you're getting rid of some of these regional banks. And the regional banks is where you're doing all your small business lending Correct. and things like that. Very much the engine of growth in the economy. Another reason why I think that the economy is, you know, not showing like the full signs yet, but is going to slow and go into recession because you're just seeing a lot less activity on the lending side of things. Yeah, no, I agree with you. You know, it's it's interesting. I also wonder this conundrum with the national debt just clipping $32 trillion. Our interest payments on that national debt are going up as we raise these rates as well, oh, as yeah. we accumulate more debt. And I think that's often discounted. I mean, we're going to be, I think we're, we're estimating over 600 billion, maybe $663 billion in interest payments is what we're going to be at on the end of this year. I mean, to put in perspective- Yeah, I thought it was somewhere around 700 billion or something yeah. like that, but yeah, uh, I mean, insane. And, you know, it's um, it's scary to think about, right? I mean, we, we're we always talking about raising the debt ceiling and, and the amount of debt, that the interest payments on the debt we're paying. Why is that? Well, because we continue to deficit spend. Right. We continue to spend more than we're taking in in tax receipts, right, from individuals and businesses. One of the reasons why I um, also like the longer term prospects of prospects of something that we talked about last time, which is Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Right. Especially when you take a look at some of these really large companies now like BlackRock and Fidelity that are filing for spot uh, ETF. Uh, filings that they want to uh, get out there. And boy, imagine if you had something like that happen, the institutional investment that would be coming into the space and driving that higher. And one of the biggest reasons why institutions can't you know, invest in that thing is because of regulatory clarity, regulatory clarity, as well as just reputational risk. But you have a spot ETF out there Boy, that's going to drive a lot more activity. That's a little side note there. And that just uh, but, happened, right? We just got that yeah, uh, two days ago. Well, it didn't get approved yet, but they filed for it, right? And if anybody could get it done, I think it's companies like BlackRock and Fidelity. Yeah, no, that's but, a big deal. Yeah, that's a big that deal. Does kinda, yeah, that does kind of bring us, though, to, you know, we talked a little bit about the Fed, and although I don't think they should, I think they're going to hike again at least one more time. But, you know, we'll see. Maybe we get some lower inflation data and a weak jobs report and maybe that that halts them, but it doesn't appear that that's going to be the case. But then we also talked a little bit about rates and, and why they haven't come down yet, but where we expect them to. But you know, we haven't really talked a little bit about housing. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's been a lot of people out there in the media that were calling for a housing bubble, saying the housing market's dead. You know, we all, all along have been saying that, hey, look at the fundamentals. We think that you can use this higher rate inv- uh, environment to your advantage because we think that you're going to see home prices appreciate. While there's higher rates, there's less competition. Well, sure enough, you know, if you just take a look at some of the like the top five appreciation reports out there, and you know what? Can I share a chart on here with you? Yeah, let me give you a permission here. Go ahead and share so, this. Yeah, let me let me just share this with you because I think this just really tells the full story here as far as what's happening in home prices. So Go for if it. you take a look at this. You know, home prices, here's what happened. So last year, 
we saw the end of the year home values after all the you know question marks and all the media, the end of the year about six percent higher. Now the first half of the year, from you know December of 2021 to June of 2022, you saw home prices on a tear. They went up nine percent, but then they gave back three percent in the second half of the year to end the year up six percent. Well, many people saying don't buy a home, home value is going to go down. You know, depending on which index you're looking at, you know, Case Shiller at the at the worst case. We were down about 3% from the peak, okay? Well, take a look at what's happening. January was very much the inflection point in the housing market. If you look at the top five appreciation reports out there that I have, you can see some reports show that as of January, home values started to go up already, but then all of them were showing home values increases in February. And then again in March, and then the latest data we have is for April. But what you'll notice is that we are seeing home values not only appreciate again, but they're starting to accelerate. In every single one of these reports, the gains are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Why are we seeing this? Well, yes, it's true that rates are higher, okay? And, and a lot of people were fearful of that. But the bottom line is, is it's supply and demand. Mm -hmm. There's no inventory out there. You know, existing home inventory, there's like a million homes for sale. You have much more in the way of demand than that, even with rates higher and home prices elevated. And you're also seeing that, um, you know, the new home front you know, they're, they're actually, the numbers are really good on the sales side because there's builders are starting to build more homes. But on the existing front, you know, sales have been really held down by a lack of inventory and, you know, some demand signs out there. You know, the latest existing home sales report, there's an average of 3.1 offers per listing. 31% of listings sold above asking price. And if you take a look at the average days on market, it was 18 days. So if there was more inventory, there would be more sales, but there's certainly demand out there. And I would say that, listen, if you want to buy a home, I know it's against, you know, maybe logic as far as what you're hearing out there in the media, but I think we're going to continue to see home prices appreciate. If you buy a home now, yes, the rate's higher, but let's just do a quick example. All right. So let's say you wanted to buy a $500,000 home and you put 20% down. So it's a $400,000 loan amount. Right? And let's just say the rate's like 7%. Well, what are your options here? You could buy the home today, or let's say you wanted to wait a year for rates to come down by 1%. Well, if you wait a year, you're going to probably save somewhere in the neighborhood of like 1800 bucks in interest over that year. But if you buy the home today, you have to remember, we're going to see appreciation. So let's just say you see 5% appreciation on the $500,000 home. So by waiting, you would miss $25,000 in appreciation to save $1,800 in interest. Even if next year you refi and it costs you $3,000 as a cost to refi, because you can always refi when the rate comes down, you're still to the plus side by over $20,000 by buying today. And not only that, what's the competition going to look like when rates do come down? Right. You know, Today, we're already, as I just mentioned, the stats, seeing competition, multiple offers, things of that nature. But what about when rates are lower? All those hibernating buyers, yeah, they're going to come back and it's going to be even harder to purchase that home then. So that's my take on housing. I think we're going to continue yeah. to see home prices appreciate. Don't listen to the negative <laughs> media out there. Um, but I, I think that there's an opportunity to be had there, even though it could be you know, a little bit contrarian. Yeah, no, I think you nailed it. And the other thing is, you know, I think your friend, John Malden, he called it the hippo in the pool. So we refer to the housing market right now. And I mean, obviously it makes up the bulk of the CPI, as you said there. But the other thing is, you know, hats off to you guys. And I'll say this in 2018, you guys came up with a chart. It's a generational graph chart. And it's mm -hmm. it statistically showed. And guys, if you want to see this chart, it's, it's going to be in our YouTube notes and it's also going to be in our website. So subscribe and check it out. But this chart is phenomenal because it actually breaks down the average age of a home buyer is 33 years old. And if you go back 30, three years, that's 1990. And that's the peak of the millennial birth rate. And it only goes from there. So you've got more people coming into the market to buy homes. And we, we just talked about the inventory problem. So now you have hibernating buyers, you've got new buyers coming in as well. And it's a compounding effect. This is only going to get worse regardless of the rates. You know, you bring up a great point and that's demographics, right? And, you know, one of the things we like to say is demographics is destiny. So it already happened, like that. you know, and, and one of the things we like to look at is, a lot of people out there are fearful of a housing bubble. Well, let's inspect what a housing bubble looks like, right? Well, during the housing bubble, you had right before it, 4 million homes for sale. And if you looked at that same birth rate chart from 33 years prior of 2006, there was a huge drop off in birth rates. So you didn't have that demand, people coming of age to buy or rent a home. 
You had a glut of supply in the market. This was fog up a mirror, 580 FICO, no assets, get approved. And this was all people that were looking to flip homes. They weren't like families buying the homes to live in it. If you look at vacancy rates back then, they were sky high. If you look at vacancy rates today, you're near record lows. So glut of supply, not enough demand from those birth rates from 33 years prior. A lot of people that are speculative because widely available credit, of course, it led to a housing bubble. If you fast forward to today, you have more than 30 million more people in the United States. You have a quarter of the available inventory. And you have demand that's rapidly starting to pick back up and low, low, low vacancy rates. And you have that demographic demand that you talked about from people that were already born back then that are now coming of age to purchase or rent a home. Well, that sounds like an opposite situation there. Right. And, it's, and it, it, it appears that we're in a, like you said, a destiny area of where rates drop. Imagine the frenzy that's going to happen during that time compared to where we are right now. It's just going to be, you know, I love when people go, oh, I'm just going to wait for the home prices to get better. Well, they're not going to get better. Or I'm going to wait for rates to go down. Now that could happen, but there's like half the world that feels that way. They're going to jump in and do the same thing. So your competition is going to lead to higher price points because people are going to put in multiple offers, et cetera, et cetera. We know how that goes. But let me ask you Well, this. I think when the, end of the year, when the end of the year is done, I think we're going to see for full year 2023, I think you're going to see somewhere between 5 and 6% appreciation nationwide. Yeah. No, that's, I think that's great, and I, I agree with you. One of the things I, I wanted to ask you about here was we keep getting this message from the current administration. We're in a strong economy. We're in a strong economy. Things are good. And even, you know, even the Federal Reserve has kind of said that a little bit, you know, Jerome Powell. Do you think we're in a strong economy? I, like I mentioned before, I think that we are seeing a lot of signs out there that the economy is weakening. I think that we are headed for a recession. You know, when you look at the Janet Yellens and the Federal Reserve and the, and the administration, what are they going to say, right? I mean, they got to talk their book a bit. Sure. And, you know, I don't know that some of them even fully understand it. But but with that being <laughs> said, I think that we are headed for uh, a recession. And I, I'm seeing a lot of signs that the economy is weakening. You know, weakening. There's, there's a term called rolling recession. Do you think that's maybe what we're seeing right now? Well, when they say that, they mean that there's certain sectors of the mm -hmm. economy that go through recessions, not all at the same time. You know, I mean, there's certainly certain areas of the of the economy that you could say have been in a recession, right? We haven't seen one in totality. Um, but the thing is, is you have to also remember, if, if you look at last year, based on the metrics of a recession forever, we saw one, right? right. Meaning two consecutive quarters of negative GDP was always your rule of thumb recession. They've changed that now, where the NBER is the National Bureau of Economic Research. They're the ones that are the referee in calling a recession. They, you know, changed the goalposts. They said that we now think that there's these seven metrics that we should look at instead of just that to determine if we're in a recession or not. So listen, whether, maybe it is a better way of determining it, but it's certainly changing the goalposts. And one of the things they said is, is that, well, we weren't in a recession last year because you had negative quarters of GDP, but not GDI, which is gross domestic income. Now, here's what's interesting that's not getting any play. While GDP this year, we've been seeing it weaken, but we haven't seen two consecutive negative GDP quarters. We actually have seen two consecutive negative GDI uh, quarters. So I think we're going to see as we get past, we just got the Q1 number showing 2% mm -hmm. annualized rate, right? Most people don't understand what that means. So they take the numbers for Q1 and they multiply them by four to get you what it would be annualized, right? So really the GDP growth was like 0.5 in Q1 and they multiply it by four and you get 2%. But Q1, I mean, this is old data now, was certainly probably the strongest quarter that we're going to see. If you look to Q2 and everything, we're seeing weaker stuff already. And remember, that was... I think SVB happened on March 9th. Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen so much credit contraction. If you watch earnings like I do, all these companies just talking about weakness, I think that you're going to start to see the GDP numbers come down. And I think you will start to see negative numbers maybe in Q3 or so of this year. And, you know, the other thing is, is people watch the stock market and earnings. You know, earnings is a little bit of a game, right? Because a lot of people probably saw the headlines like, oh, this many S&P 500 companies beat their earnings. But they're still sequentially lower significantly lower. So what happens is, is you have these analysts that say, hey, here's the top and bottom line estimates, right? Their earnings per share and their revenues. And if you set the bar low, they can beat it. 
It makes it easier to beat it. And then it looks like an earnings beat. But compare it to the previous earnings report, and it's much lower still. It's still coming down, even though they beat earnings because you set the bar low. Right. And I think it's worth noting on here that, you know, the last, I think, 14 times we've seen aggressive Fed hikes, such as what we're seeing right now, 11 of those 14 have led to a recession. They, well, recession oh, almost, has almost, almost all of the rate hike cycles lead to recessions. You know, a couple of those, you had some things happen that saved the economy, like the internet, for instance, was mm-hmm. one of them, right? But, um, you know, and the dot-com stuff. But uh, but this the Fed, this is going to be no different here, where the Fed's right. going to continue to hike and overcorrect. You know, the example I like to use is they get in the shower and, you know, the water's cold. And instead of, you know, putting the water to like a level that would be right, they crank that heat all the way up and then it starts getting warm and then they're scolding their skin and they got to turn it back to a level that's you know more adequate. They overcorrect it, right? Mm-hmm. And they got to dial it back. I mean, the Fed's going to do this again. I mean, if you if you pull up a chart of Fed funds rate, which is their rate, right. and you take a look at recessions coupled with that, like you mentioned, throughout history, besides maybe a few examples, almost every single time the Fed goes on a rate hike cycle, you get a recession. And this is no ordinary rate hike cycle. This is one of the fastest, most aggressive rate hike cycles we've seen in history. Yeah, and I think the reason we keep talking about this R word, and I want everyone to understand, is that, and you said it earlier, and I just want to come back to it, following a recession or going through a recession, rates come down. Mm -hmm. Housing has done well during recessions, except for one, right? We know which one that was. That was caused by housing, but it does well throughout these times as well. So, you know, we're not not jumping up and down hoping to have one here, praising one, but we want to say that, hey, there's also a light at the end of the tunnel for this if you're in the real estate industry, if you're a loan officer, like this could be good for our industry and good for the consumers as well during that time and homeowners right now. Yeah, most people don't, I think, have a hard time following that, right? So Mm -hmm. here's how I like to break it down. If you look at a chart of home prices and recessions, during recessions, in almost all of them, home prices either remain pretty stable or increased during the recession. Now, people say, well, that doesn't make sense because during recession, the unemployment rate goes up, people lose their jobs, and those people are no longer in the housing, right? And that's true. But if you take a look, let's just say the unemployment rate goes up by 1%. So now you got one and a half billion people, some of which that are losing their jobs if they're on the very lower end. Nothing wrong with those jobs, but I'm just saying maybe they weren't even in the housing market. Sure. But now let's just say you have one and a half million people that are no longer in the housing market, just to use all of them. But you also always see rates decline. For every 1% drop in rates, now you have like 5 million more people that can now you know, get approved and, and come into the housing market, right? So yes, you're losing some on that unemployment side, but you're gaining the benefit of rates coming down on this side. And that typically is, is, is overcoming the negative that you see, and you see the housing market perform well. Yeah, and I think that that's something that people tend to forget when they when they hear that word. So I really appreciate you breaking that down for them. So a couple of last things here. Obviously, people ask me all the time, like, hey, you get these guests on the show. You guys talk about this. You chop it up. You go back and forth. Like, how do you guys keep up with all of this stuff? Like, what's the what's the mainstream way of doing it? And I would say years on, on both of our sides of following and studying and learning this. And, and maybe that's our background through you know, college and, and so forth under our profession. But I'll also say this, you don't have to be in the lending industry or the real estate industry to get this information. You can join MBS Highway. You can join the highway. You can be a part of CMA. You don't have to have a license to do it. And I would encourage you, the one thing I continue to say on here, and I've caught some flack for it, is the news is not your friend. It's not your friend. Social media is not your friend. And you've got to learn and take things into account for yourself to make your own decisions. And that's where MBS Highway can help you with that. And you would be surprised at what all it can do for you for the price in which you pay. Dan, where can they find out more about MBS Highway, my friend? Yeah, so thank you for that, Quentin. So if you go to mbshighway.com, you can see that you can sign up for our service there. If you uh, go to Certified Mortgage Advisor, if you wanted to really get a deep dive education on how all these things work, you can sign up for that. And then listreports.com is where you can sign up for the platform to give you the agent intelligence, as well as being able to get the elite platform that does all the marketing for you. But rather than them you know, go to that, if you wanted to sign up as a as a part of being on this podcast for any of the services that we had just kind of talked about, you know, Quentin, happy to give them a discount if they just want to email uh, my assistant. She can give them a discount as per this show. And it's just Christine at MBSHighway.com. And we will make sure to take care of you and get you set up and uh, and explain it a little bit further for you. And then the last thing, Quentin, is, is you know, if you have any crypto enthusiasts on the show... You know, if they want to, if they want to 
learn about crypto every single day, get some trading ideas. Should we go long or short technical analysis, breakdown of the coins? Then that's CryptoCharged.com. Yeah, and a fantastic service, guys. I tell you what, I was going to tee it up. You beat me to it. But I, I love this because another opportunity to learn more about that. And, you know, I kind of want to show your versatility on the show today because on episode nine, you, you went all in on crypto, broke it down. And I was like, he's got so much more to offer. So I'm really glad we got a chance to do that today. But Dan knows his shit on crypto. And so does the guys over there at Crypto Charge. They're excellent. I've been a part of that membership as well. Seeing what you guys are doing over there is great. And again, uh, I will put Christine's information in the show notes. Guys, check us out on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. Subscribe at What's Your One More with the number one. All the notes, all the graphs will be on there. They'll also be on our website at 1mpodcast.com. And if you like these episodes, please share them. Five-star review us on Apple, Spotify. And if you haven't checked out Spotify's new release recently, they're letting all the video show while the audio is on there as well. So you're getting the best of both worlds. But check it out, share it, five-star review us, leave us some comments, and always follow us on our socials at What's Your One More with the number one. Dan, as always, my friend, thanks for joining us on the show today. Hey, thanks so much, Quinn. All right, brother. I got one more shot, I'm gonna make it. One more chance, I'm gonna take it. I meant it when I said it, now it's time for me to do it. I got one life to live, so I put all into it, yeah.